So this past year at Journey, we did this series called Epic, and it really was a one-year journey through the entire Bible. We went from Old Testament to New, and I hope for those of you who have been here the whole time that you really had a great time. We're really in our last two weeks of it. Today, we're obviously going to talk about Christmas, and then next week, we're going to be talking about Revelation. So I hope you come back for that message. It's going to be a great way to conclude the year. Let's go ahead and pray and dive right in to God's word. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory. You are our king. And today, as we celebrate through the sharing of the story of your son, Lord, let it ignite our hearts either for the first time or for the first time in a long time. Lord, would you use these moments that we have together to stir us into a relationship with you. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we give you glory today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So I gotta do a little poll before we start. Um, I don't know about you when it comes to movies or songs, so how many of you are the kind of person that would watch a movie over and over again? Anybody? There's something wrong with you people. I mean, even if it's a good movie, that's not, you know, I just, I, I have trouble sitting through certain things over and over again. So by default, I guess how many of you are not into watching the same movie over and over again? How about songs? Some of you with kids, you know, let it go, let it go. Like annoying after a little while, right? But man, when I think of the Jewish people and one of the things that they did is they have these traditions where they share them and they tell the same story over and over again. And at first when I thought of that being the person who doesn't like to watch movies over and over again, I said, maybe that's boring. Maybe that's something that, you know, why in the heck do they do that? But the older I've gotten, the more I've uh, gotten a little seasoned in life, I love some of those stories. And I love hearing them over and over again because some of them are worthy of being heard over and over again. Maybe not let it go. Come on, Jesus. If I never hear that one again, I will be okay. But man, when it comes to the story of Christmas, it's a story worth telling and passing from generation to generation. You see, I have a saying, the gospel's only as good as the next generation. And I think that's why the Jewish people got it. It said, train up your children in the way that they should go. And when they're older, they will not depart from it. Share these stories with your kids. And this is one of those stories that's worth telling over and over and over again, lest we forget it, because man, it is one of the most important moments in the Bible. Maybe the only one that's equivalent to it is it was when Jesus dies on a cross and rises again, right? So this coming of a king and this whole year as we've been through Epic and we were in the Old Testament, it talked about this king who would come. It talked about, you know, a savior of the world that was to be. And in the story that we're reading today, it's the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament scriptures that we read throughout the year. It's the Epic of it. It's the big to do of the entire Bible that God would leave his heavenly dwelling place and come and dwell amongst his people, that he would forgo this beautiful fellowship and relationship that he had with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, and he would take on the form of man. He would become fully man and fully God so that he could save and redeem people like you and me, people that are undeserving, people that are far from God, people at times who are enemies of God, right? He would come, he loved us enough that he would die and ultimately rise again that we would have life. So this story to me is beautiful. It's worth spending time and time and time again, year after year. Last week, for those of you who were here, we read about Jesus, the light of the world. We read this verse, 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And we shared about how that light can ultimately bring us great joy because the grace, love, and forgiveness of God washes over us. And man, I didn't think last week was going to be as powerful a message as it ended up being. The devil always likes to steal my voice when I'm trying to get started. But man, was it amazing. God used that message to just flood over our congregation and bring a sense of peace and joy to us all. It was much more powerful than I thought. Man, I was so glad God moved in that way. I feel like I need to pray again. Come on, Jesus. <coughs> so let's dive right into this story that never gets old. 
Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled and tried to discern what kind of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. Why is nobody getting excited about this here today? And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And in this, the sixth month with her is called barren for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So that birth of a savior foretold from old was coming to pass and we're hearing the story of it. Mary, who was just a young girl, was visited by none other than the angel Gabriel. And when she did, it says there was fear, right? She was a little bit nervous at first. And then the angel says to her, peace, Mary, everything's going to work out. Now, I think of a question that happened. You know, God spoke to Abraham and his wife earlier in Scripture, and he told them that they would be the father of many nations. And what was her reaction? She laughed, right? This is not the same reaction because God was already preparing Mary's heart for what was to happen. The angel tells her, for nothing is impossible with God. Do you believe that here today? Yes. Now, let's say it. Say, nothing, nothing. is impossible, impossible. with God. Nothing is impossible with God. And she replies because her heart is prepared. Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Some of you need the impossible to become possible today. May this story remind you that God can do it. Maybe we need to say it again. Say nothing, nothing. is impossible, impossible with God. Man, he is on your side. He loves you. He cares for you. He loved you enough that he would send his son to be in a relationship with you. Might we be reminded of that? <clears throat> because you might need the messages as much as I do. As we kick off this new year, we're going to be preaching a new series in January called Reboot. Man, the season that we're in right now, the devil tries to steal it through so much busyness. He gets anybody tired up in here this morning? You're a little bit worn out. I see a lot. Oh, they're just going like that. It's just like that, right? So the devil tries to steal our joy. The devil tries to steal it by making us so busy, by getting us so worn out. And sometimes if you think about it, we treat our phones a little bit more like God than we do God. Do we not? How many of you have done this? Your phone was running out of battery and you didn't have your charger with you and you ran to Best Buy or somewhere to buy a charger. Come on. See, in, in January, we're going to talk about, man, having that same kind of a desire in our heart to plug into God and watch what he will do. So if you're anything like me and you need the impossible to become possible in your life and some changes need to occur and you're looking to be refreshed if you're new here, I want to encourage you to not just come on Christmas time, not just come on these seasons and the big days, but man, allow God to wash over you all throughout the year. Kick off the new year right. Join us for our reboot series coming up. Luke 2.2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus to all the world that they should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinus was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was one of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them at the inn." See, in our generation, in most generations, the kings are born in the palaces, are they not? 
See, but we have a king who loved us enough that he'd be born on 103rd Street. Come on, he would not even be worried about, you know, dangers that might abound driving down that street. Why y'all laughing at that, right? Some of you, I drive down that street daily. What's wrong with 103rd? He went to that place where nobody wanted him because he loves us that much. He loved the outcast. He loved the drug addicted. He loved those who were deemed less by the world. And he says, I'm going to come in the most unlikely of places. I don't need a palace. I want to be with the people. How amazing is that? That's the kind of God that we serve. That's how much God loves you. How cool is that? He is the first God of the people for the people. Come on, Jesus. God loves us that much. People like you and me who are sitting in this room, while most of the world rejected him and wouldn't receive him in the form that he came, there was always a group of people who still sought him. People like you and I in our generation, they're saying, less and less people are going to church, less and less people care about Jesus. And we see the reflection of that in society around us, do we not? But we have this opportunity as believers in our generation in the most unlikely of places of Jacksonville to be a light to the world, a light to your neighbors, a light in your workplace. Jesus is the light of the world, but man, he implants his spirit in each of us that in turn we might be the light of the world. Matthew 2.2, 2, we'll skip from Luke over to Matthew for just a moment. They both tell different facets of this beautiful story. And after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. How appropriate that the light would illuminate the darkness and begin to show them the way because the light of the world has come. There's something inside of each of us that senses that there is a God the Holy Spirit touches us and he begins to draw us out of darkness and into the light that we might be introduced to Jesus, our King. And many of you have already had that experience. Many of you have already come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't, I, find, I pray that you find him today in the midst of that manger. I pray you would see him for who he is, Jesus, the light of the world. But see, when we find ourselves in trouble, when we find ourselves in darkness, the devil never lets go easy, does he? He doesn't want to just let us go. We suffer. We struggle. If you were here last week, I shared my story about some of the idiotic things that I did around Christmas time when I was addicted to drugs and alcohol and how I made a fool of myself and embarrassed my family. And those strongholds don't go away very easy. The devil wants to keep us where we're at. The devil doesn't want this story to be told. The devil doesn't want your story to change. He doesn't want to see you thrive. He wants to see you beat up, broken down. But we are victorious in Christ. What did we read earlier? Nothing is impossible with God. You can overcome. God can change you. Matthew 2, 3 gives us a glimpse of this. When Herod, the king, heard this, he was troubled because this rumor of another king and all of Jerusalem with him and assembling all the chief priests and scribes and the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was born. It seems as though he's starting off innocently enough. And that's how sin often creeps into our life, doesn't it? Starts off something innocent and then before you know it, you're in too deep and you can't find your way out. Matthew 2, verse 5, he told them, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, and are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd his people Israel. See, the Old Testament pointed to this moment that was being fulfilled Man, what joy we have in retrospect as we see Jesus, the Son of God, coming in fulfillment of all these prophecies. Then Herod summons the wise men and secretly ascertained from them what the star had, when the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. See, the devil didn't really want him to worship Jesus. The devil wants to steal all of our worship, does he not? 
He wants to keep us from worshiping the one true God. So he'll put things and landmines in your path so that it'll keep you from experiencing the fullness of who Jesus Christ really is. Each of those landmines for us is completely different, but there's no doubt he places them in your path. He doesn't want you to experience the joy of knowing who Jesus is. But let this story be a reminder of you today that God's word is true, that nothing is impossible with God, that he loves you, that he came so that you might have life in him and that the devil is always a liar. He's always a liar. He's trying to deceive them into telling them so that he could go kill this baby and snuff out this story. But thanks be to God, God had other plans. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them in the, until it came to rest over the place that the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. I'm reminded of the scriptures that we read earlier in the year that said, those who seek me will find me. Those who seek me will find me. Are you seeking Jesus? Are you seeking a relationship with him? Or have the things of the world got you so deceived and so taken in another direction that all you're doing is running a rat race and seeking the things of this world rather than seeking the one true king? Man, he's there. He's waiting for you. He wants you to find him like that treasure, they come and they worship at his feet. And in that place of worship is fullness of joy. I walked by and I heard those carolers out there this morning. I tried to sing with them. They kicked me out because I'm very bad at singing. <clears throat> let it go, let it go. Um, but I walked up and just hearing them sharing those stories of our king in song, how beautiful was that? They might be out there afterwards. Maybe we'll gather around them a little bit and do a little sing-along before we go. I'll stay in the back, I promise. I'm already losing my voice. It's not good. <clears throat> but what a blessing it is to hear those songs and worship. And when you're in the midst of that, it's hard to not be joyous. Is it true? Man, I walked outside yesterday in our house and everybody had gone. My kids had gone. My wife had gone. They were all out running errands and doing things. And there was this crisp, cool weather in the air. I walk out and just looking at the cows and yes, that's my life. I'm looking at the cows over the fence. And I was just like, wow, God is good. God is so good in the midst of all this busyness. I had that few still small moments of calmness, just walking out there. And I got to worship God for those moments. And any worries of the world that I might have had just went by the wayside. And man, I experienced a few moments of intimacy with God. I don't want my life to be just a few moments of intimacy with God, nor do I want yours to be that either. He wants to walk and talk with you every single day. If you need a reboot, I'm telling you, come back at the beginning of the year. If you need that reboot, we're going to talk about that. How can we find that? How can we make that our lifestyle so that we experience him day in, day out? Because that's the life that he wants for you. Now, you might be a little bit beat up in here and you're like, Eric, that life is impossible. What did we, nothing is impossible with God. Man, how beautiful would it be to wake and not look at your phone and be worried, but wake and spend time with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He wants to spend time with you. Could you imagine that? Can you imagine that? How awesome and amazing is that? May we be reminded today by the old cliche that says, wise men still seek him. Seek him and you will find him. I think most of us don't seek him very often. And then we walk along the side of the way troubled all the time. Man, if you seek him, you will find him. He will give you that star that will show you the way. You'll experience an intimacy and freedom in him that you could never imagine. The end of the story goes this way. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. 
And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among them whom with you is pleased. Worship team, you could begin to make your way back up here for a moment. What would their response be to what they witnessed? And what will your response be to what you've heard today? Will it be one of wonder and worship? Or will you go on living the same way that you've been living if you're finding yourself in a difficult place? Life doesn't have to be the same. The God of the impossible is here amongst us today and he wants to change our lives. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made it known the saying that had been told to them concerning God and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured these things in her heart, pondering them and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and all that they had seen as it had been told to them. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. Lord, I pray you use this story once again, this story that many of us know so well. We've read it time and time again. But I pray through the hearing of your word and through the worship that you use this message to ignite the hearts of all who are in this room, reminding us that you are the light of the world, that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, that you are worthy to be worshiped, honored, praised, and adored. And if throughout the course of this year, we have failed to look for that star in the eastern sky, would this moment of reflection remind us of that need that you've placed deep within each of our hearts to seek you? Would we make it our life's goal to spend time with you? Would you overwhelm us with your peace and your joy? And in return, would we like the shepherds, just go out and tell the world about you. Tell the world about your goodness, about your loving kindness, about your mercy, about the impossible things that you've done in our life. Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place for the moments that we have together. We ask you to move on our hearts and our minds, reminding us of the real reason for the season. And if you're here today and you're just at a place where you know you need to either dedicate or rededicate your heart to Christ today, man, we'd love to share that moment with you. And I promise to do nothing to embarrass you, but I would love to pray for you. In fact, nobody's looking around right now. But if that's you, would you do me a favor? You need to dedicate or rededicate your heart today. Just raise your hand real high right where you're at and I'll pray for you. Is that you today? Is there anyone in this place? I see your hand and yours. Thank you and yours. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, and yours. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for those who raised their hand. And before the service concludes, I pray they would come up here to the front and speak to one of us and we could give them some next steps in starting their walk of Christ in a great way. But Father, by means of dedication or rededication today, we just say that, Jesus, you are the son of the living God. You left that heavenly dwelling place to come dwell among us as a man. You're that baby that was born and wrapped in swaddling clothes. We believe this story of the wise men coming to seek you. We believe this story of Mary, the virgin, being birthed by the Holy Spirit. We believe every word of it. We, like the shepherds in the field, stand in awe of you today, and we commit or recommit our lives to you this very morning saying we love you, we praise you, we give you glory and from this moment forward we will live our lives for you and you alone. We will seek you with all our heart, strength, soul and mind. You are our God and our King. 
If we've strayed from that, forgive us, oh God. Set our hearts right, Holy Spirit. May we live every waking moment for you in Jesus' name. Would you put your hands together for our God and King? We've got one more song that we'd like to sing together, then I'll close in prayer. If during this song, you'd like to come up and take communion, there's communion elements to both my left and my right. You're more than welcome to come up by yourself or with your family. If you wanna spend some time in God's presence, you could come up here and kneel down at these altars. If you need to pray with somebody, I'll be up here as well as others that would love to join hands with you and pray with you. And then you were given a little candle as you walked in. And if you didn't get it as you walked in, you're welcome to grab one. I'm sure some of the ushers will be down the aisle. And if you want to get all cozy and we didn't use the real candles, we didn't want wax all over everybody. Come on, Lord, help us. But remember that Jesus is the light of the world. After the song, I'll come up and close and pray. Enjoy God's presence for just a few moments longer.
pray that if you walk through these doors with any heaviness or sin or challenge that was weighing on your heart, that you would just let it go, let it go. <laughs> In all serious, thank you so much for joining us today. And what's become a bit of a tradition for me, I like to conclude every Christmas service with really the same challenge. If you have these lights with you, hold them up for just a second, a little high, so I could see them. You know, there's this thing in the Bible where it says that Jesus is the light of the world. But then we like to distribute these lights to remind us of how he turned the tables on us in Matthew 5, 13. He says this to us in our generation. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. He says this, you are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Go and be the light of the world. God bless you, everybody. Thank you for being here. Merry Christmas! Yes.